So chapter six is quite interesting in that it focuses on understanding the principles behind organic reactions and understanding how to predict the product selectivity for organic reactions and understanding the thermodynamic and kinetic principles behind reaction selectivity. So first and foremost, we're gonna take a broader look at organic molecules and how their structural features impact their reactivity. So polarizability is defined as the tendency to undergo polarization, where polarization can be defined as a change in electron distribution in a bond or molecule as a response to the change in the electronic nature of the surrounding atoms. So for example, these polar bonds here have an uneven distribution of electron density where the carbon is electron deficient and our electronegative atom, in this case sulfur, is electron rich. So we say that these carbon halogen or carbon nonmetal bonds are polarized. And because this carbon has a buildup of electron deficiency, a buildup of positive charge, it can engage and it can selectively participate in certain chemical reactions. That carbon has been activated for further chemical reaction. Now, polar reactions occur between regions of high electron density and regions of low electron density. So one common piece of terminology that you'll see throughout our discussion of organic chemistry is this idea of nucleophiles and electrophiles. And electrophiles are defined as an electron poor species. Um, a Lewis acid can also function as an electrophile. So below are a list of molecules containing electrophilic functionalities or electrophilic atoms. So we know in a carbonyl, for example, the carbonyl carbon has a buildup of partial positive charge. This is really easy to see if we draw our resonance structure and we notice that in one of our, made, one of our contributing resonance structures, this central carbonyl carbon has a large amount of cation character. By the same token, this alkyl chloride, our chloride is electronegative, so it pulls electron density in this carbon chlorine bond away from carbon, and that in turn leads to carbon building up a partial positive charge. So we can say that these carbons are electrophilic, they're electron deficient. Likewise, in this vinyl ketone, and we'll, we'll unpack this in detail using resonance structures. For this vinyl ketone, we can notice that we have two carbons that are electron deficient. And the selectivity for which carbon prefers to react will be discussed in later chapters. Now, bromine itself, this, this bromine-bromine bond doesn't look particularly polarized but bromine in many chemical reactions can function as an electrophilic equivalent of Br+. So it's common, when we, especially when we talk about reactions of alkenes, that you'll see Br+, or Br+, equivalents as common electrophiles. Looking at acids, for example, this hydrogen chlorine bond is polarized towards chlorine, Chlorine is electron rich and this hydrogen is electron deficient. So this hydrogen is relatively electrophilic and it can engage in reaction with nucleophilic or electron rich species. Finally, our formal carbocation can also function as a quite effective electrophile. So an electrophile is defined as an electron deficient species and where this fits into our overall understanding of organic reactions is that 
Electrophiles in general prefer to react with nucleophiles in polar reactions. And the main purpose, the main function of an electrophile is that it will accept electron density and lone pairs. So that begs the question then, what is a nucleophile? Well, a nucleophile is defined as an electron rich species. A Lewis base can be thought of as a common nucleophilic motif. So for example, we have our enolate. As we can clearly see, this oxygen is electron rich. Looking at this enolate, is there another atom in this molecule that is electron rich? So an enolate can function as an oxygen centered nucleophile. Just taking a look at this structure for a moment, does anyone notice a potential other nucleophilic or electron rich atom in this molecule. And to help us see that, let me just draw a little resonance structure. So my question is looking at this enolate, it can function as an oxygen based nucleophile, but what other atom is electron rich in this structure? What other atom is electron rich? The carbon, exactly right. So we have two potential sites of reactivity. That's why we discussed drawing resonance structures in detail earlier on in this class. Perfect. So another common nucleophile are our alkenes. Alkenes can function as nucleophilic species because this double bond is relatively electron rich. Uh, we have our alkoxide motifs. This is a pretty common Lewis base. This can function as a, as a nucleophile and as a base. We have our organometallics, which function more, well, in this case, this Grignard reagent can be thought of as a carbon-centered anion. And we can have formal carbon-centered anions such as the acetylide anion. In all cases, when we're looking at a nucleophile, we're dealing with an electron-rich species. A nucleophile is almost always going to function as a donor of electron density. And nucleophiles prefer to react with electrophiles via polar mechanisms. Does this overview make sense? Does this idea of a nucleophile and electrophile make sense to everyone so far? Any questions so far? Perfect, perfect. So I provided you a table of common polarity patterns for different functional groups. Um, I'm not expecting you to memorize it, but this is a great way for you to check your work in terms of assigning electron rich and electron deficient atoms. Because by looking at which atoms are electron rich and electron deficient, we can begin to write logical mechanisms for our reactions. So I just provided this reference table on page two, um, if you're ever unsure. Now, what's pretty interesting is that molecules can have electrophilic and nucleophilic sites. So electrophilic sites are electron rich, nucleophilic sites are electron rich. Now, just like we did all the way in chapters one and two, to determine the distribution of electron density in our molecule, we look at the partial charge of each atom considering our resonance contribution. So for example, when we looked at our ketone, right, we could draw a major resonance structure where we have a localized charge, a localized negative charge on our oxygen atom and a localized positive charge on our carbon atom. So as such, we can say that this oxygen in our ketone is somewhat nucleophilic, while the carbon directly attached to our ketone functionality is electrophilic. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that look familiar to everyone? Does this idea of resonance contributions 
and looking at resonance structures to identify electron deficient, partially positive atoms, and electron rich, partially negative atoms make sense so far. Perfect. So likewise, if we have a structure here, which is known as an enamine, you'll see a ton of this in organic chemistry too. We can draw a major contributing structure in which rather than having our electron density localized on nitrogen, we actually have a significant amount of electron density located on our enamine carb. So if we were dissecting an enamine and we were looking at our nucleophilic atoms, we'd assign the nitrogen and carbon as our nucleophilic atoms. These atoms are relatively electron rich. Accurately identifying the nucleophilic and electrophilic atoms in your molecule can help you draw reasonable mechanisms. Now, there's one other thing to consider. There's one other thing to consider. Um, we have to really pay attention to inductive effects here when we're thinking about nucleophilic and electrophilic atoms. So atoms bonded to more electronegative atoms are electron deficient. Atoms bonded to less electronegative atoms are electron rich. So if we think about, for example, a carbon boron bond, which atom is more electronegative, carbon or boron? Which atom is more electronegative? So if we think about our, if we look at the periodic table and we see boron followed by carbon, and if electronegativity increases going up and to the right, we see students commenting that they think now carbon is more electronegative. That's exactly right. So if we think about a carbon boron bond, it's really polarized so that carbon is substantially more electron rich than usual. Now this is important because if you're trying to draw a mechanism, you wanna correctly identify which atoms are electron rich. atoms will function as our nucleophiles in many reactions. Comparatively, if we look at a carbon chlorine bond, which atom is more electronegative? Which atom is more electronegative? in a carbon chlorine bond, which atom is more electronegative? Everyone's saying chlorine, exactly right. So this bond is polarized with most of our electron density lying on our chlorine. So as a result, the chlorine would be relatively nucleophilic and our carbon would be relatively electrophilic, relatively electron deficient. We can use the same logic and we can note that the sulfur hydrogen bond, the hydrogen is electron deficient. And in our carbon sulfur bond, our carbon is electron deficient. Now, I, although I told you, you didn't have to memorize every single electronegativity value to, the, to one decimal point, you do need to be familiar with common differences in electronegativity. So let's look at this following reagent. This is known as NBS or N-bromyl succinamide. And it often gives students a lot of trouble when drawing mechanisms because they get stuck identifying the, the electrophilic atom. Just as a hint for everyone, NBS can be thought of as an equivalent of Br+. So my question to you is, looking at this nitrogen boron bond, oh, sorry, this nitrogen bromine bond, so looking at our nitrogen bromine bond, which atom is more electronegative? Which atom is more electronegative, nitrogen or bromine? Considering that n-bromyl succinamide functions as an equivalent of bromine plus, in n-bromyl succinamide, this nitrogen bromine bond is actually polarized towards nitrogen. This process is assisted by the fact that we have our electron deficient ketone functionalities further drawing electron density away from bromine and towards our nitrogen atom. So looking at n-bromyl succinamide, we'd notice that this nitrogen bromine bond is polarized towards nitrogen 
the bromine is relatively electron deficient, while our nitrogen is relatively electron rich. So by identifying our nucleophilic and electrophilic atoms, we can begin to understand and distinguish patterns of reactivity. It would be illogical if we have a, a reaction involving N-bromyl succinamide to have our bromine behaving as a nucleophile. It would be perfectly reasonable for this bromine to function as an electrophile. Does that make sense to everyone? Does this idea of looking at structures and identifying nucleophilic and electrophilic sites or atoms in our molecule make sense? Perfect, perfect. And if there are any questions, again, don't be shy to ask in the chat or verbally. Now, just to, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, let's do a few examples. I'll do the first one to start us off and then we'll break the class out into a group. And what we'll do is we'll work on this problem for about another three to four minutes after we've seen this representative example, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss our final answers. So I'll do this first representative example. And in the problem, we're asked to identify the atoms that are electron deficient and electron rich. So we're looking at our resonance structures and we're trying to identify the atoms that contain a localized or partial positive or negative charge in either of our contributing resonance structures. So I can immediately notice that this oxygen has a localized negative charge. This oxygen is going to be relatively electron rich. Drawing out my resonance structures now, I'm going to do this one arrow pushing step at a time. I push my electrons in my double bond up to my carboxylic acid oxygen. That gives me the following resonance structure. It is very minor. The structure doesn't follow the octet rule, but it's very informative because it allows us to note that this central carbon is electron deficient. You can see this pattern of reactivity for many reactions of carboxylic acids. Now, in order to draw a new resonance structure, we're gonna kick down our rightmost oxygen lone pair and we're gonna regenerate our carbon-oxygen double bond. That in turn gives us the following structure. And as we notice, our topmost oxygen has a partial negative charge. So if we're identifying all of the electron-rich and electron-deficient atoms in our structure, we would note that both of our oxygens are electron rich, while this carbon is electron deficient. Does this example make sense to everyone? Does this example make sense? So in order to verify, in order to help us test and reinforce this skill, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at the following two structures and we're going to identify the electron rich and electron deficient atoms in these two structures. Now, I would like students to share their responses in the chat, or you can also use the annotate tool to draw out some of these resonance structures and label the electron deficient and electron rich atoms using the annotate tool as part of the Zoom meeting features. It, as a reminder, the annotate tool is under the tab titled meeting options. So let's take about, let's take about three to four minutes and let's identify the electron rich and electron deficient atoms in each of these two structures. Don't be shy to share your responses in the chat or verbally, or to share any questions that you have in the chat or verbally. And it's great to see we have students already breaking out the annotate tool and beginning to draw out their proposed structures. 
So let's keep working through this example and we'll discuss in about three to four minutes. So in the first structure, we have a student contribution indicating that the carbon is electron rich and the phosphorus is electron deficient. And you're more than welcome as well, uh, if you see a proposed drawing to contribute your own drawings to this discussion or to voice your agreement or, dis or disagreement. So for example, we see in the chat that we have a few students who are agreeing with the assignments for structure A. For structure B, we have another student drawing out a few of the resonance structures to help label the electron rich and electron deficient atoms. And we have the following set of resonance structures. And now the student is adding their labels for the electron rich and electron deficient atoms. This is wonderful to see. I'd like to give students a little bit more time to voice their agreement, disagreement, um, or any questions that they have. To answer the question posed for structure A, the reason why the electron density prefers to be located on carbon is that when drawing resonance structures, in general, we want to place our negative charges on our more electronegative atoms. And if we think about the carbon phosphorus bond, it's actually polarized towards carbon. So carbon is the more electronegative atom. So in turn, as the student noted, it would be reasonable then when you're deciding how to distribute this double bond electron density to place that electron density on carbon, the more electronegative atom. Did that answer your question? These reagents are known as Wittig reagents and they're commonly used for carbon-carbon bond formation. They're quite useful reagents. And we'll see these again when we talk about another feature that can help drive and influence reactivity. So I just wanna give everyone about another 30 seconds to a minute to voice their commentary for structures A and B. Do you agree? Do you disagree with the proposed uh, partial charge assignments? Um, do you have any comments to add, any questions about these structures? Um, I just wanna give everyone another opportunity to share their thoughts and perspective. It's great to see the class sharing their perspective using the annotate tool and asking questions and sharing their perspective in the chat. And we'll discuss this example in about 30 seconds. Is everyone in agreement with these resonance structures and the drawn charge assignment? And if you disagree, that's okay. Um, in which case I'd like you to share a little bit more of your logic so I can help understand and, and we can discuss it and potentially see an interesting discussion point as a class. Okay, so let's discuss these examples. This, the student responses and the class responses were perfect. They're exactly what I was looking for. Um, so thinking about this carbon phosphorus double bond, carbon's more electronegative. So we're gonna kick our electron density in our double bond towards our carbon. That gives us the following resonance structure, which is a minor contributor, but is important for understanding the distribution of electron density in our molecule. As such, we can clearly see that carbon is electron rich and phosphorus is electron deficient. This informs how we draw mechanisms, which are step-by-step -step run throughs of a chemical reaction. For this vinyl ketone, which we've seen earlier on in this discussion, we can draw a series of resonance structures. 
first of which we kick our electron density up to our ketone oxygen. Then we kick our double bond electron density across to our carbocation. And then there's one other resonance structure where we kick our electron density down and we end up with a negative charge on our alpha carbon. Perfect. So these are all of our resonance structures. And as we notice, we can identify our electron rich and electron deficient atoms. So this top oxygen and this alpha carbon are electron rich, while our middle carbonyl carbon and what we call our beta carbon is electron deficient. This, this last note that the alpha carbon is electron rich, it's minor, but it does come up in many mechanisms. Does this idea of identifying nucleophilic and electrophilic sites in a molecule make sense to everyone? Perfect. So, Let's talk a little bit about organic mechanisms. So fundamentally, organic reactions occur through bond forming and bond breaking steps. Mechanisms describe the movement of electrons in bond forming and bond breaking steps in a chemical reaction. Now, it's important when drawing mechanisms that you understand what you're implying when you draw a step. So some bond forming and bond breaking events are concerted. The bond breaking and bond forming steps occur simultaneously. So if you draw the bond forming and bond breaking step as one set of arrows, you're implying that this is a concerted reaction, which has implications for the reaction mechanism. An example of a, convert, of a concerted reaction is the SN2 reaction, which we'll talk about later on in this class, where the bond forming and bond breaking steps occur in a single step. So as we notice, we have our bond forming step drawn with this first arrow. That's our bond forming step. And simultaneously, we are breaking our carbon bromine bond. So this is a concerted reaction because our bond forming and bond breaking steps are drawn simultaneously. Does that make sense to everyone? So in a stepwise reaction, in a stepwise reaction, as the name implies, the bond breaking and bond forming steps occur in separate steps in the mechanism. So an example of this is the SN1 reaction, which is a classic stepwise reaction where the bond forming and bond breaking occurs over multiple discrete steps. So for example, in step one, we break our carbon bromine bond in step two, we form a new carbon-carbon bond. So this would be a stepwise reaction. Does that make sense to everyone? This idea of concerted versus stepwise. It's really important that when you're writing a mechanism, you respect the fact that the reactions can be either concerted or stepwise, or even the individual step in a reaction can be concerted or stepwise. Okay. Perfect, perfect. So we indicate the movement of electrons in chemical reaction mechanisms using curved arrow notation. And in the case of polar reactions, polar reactions involve heterolytic and unsymmetrical or asymmetrical bond forming or bond breaking events. So for example, if you have a carbon chlorine bond and a 
polar mechanism, you are breaking this bond and you're engaging in heterolytic bond breaking, where we have the movement of two electrons from our bond to one of our atoms. So that gives us a carbocation. Let's fill in some hydrogens just for completeness. And a chlorine centered anion. So polar reactions, they have a full headed arrow and our bond forming and bond breaking steps are described using the movement of two electrons using a double headed arrow. Does everyone see how this double headed arrow is showcasing the movement of two electrons in our bond breaking step? Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on this idea? So this may start to look a little bit familiar to everyone because we've actually seen this before when we look at acid-base reactions. So in acid-base reactions, we have a, what can be viewed as a concerted bond forming and bond breaking step. Everyone notice how this mechanism as drawn is concerted. We have the bond forming and bond breaking step occurring at once. We are dealing with a double headed arrow, which signifies the movement of two electrons as part of our bond forming and bond breaking steps. And in this case, we are breaking our oxygen hydrogen bond and forming our nitrogen hydrogen bond. Yes, so when we, when we mention this idea of unsymmetrical bond forming and bond breaking events, as we notice in our bond breaking step, all of our bond electron density is moving to a single atom. It, there's not an even split of electron density. It is a two electron movement where one atom receives all of the electron density in the bond at the end of the bond breaking step. Perfect. So when you think about polar reactions, you can always sort of use acid-base reactions as an anchor. We've seen acid-base reaction mechanisms before. We've seen arrow pushing for acid-base reactions. And just remember, polar reactions, asymmetrical, heterolytic bond breaking and bond forming events, and two electrons two electron motions. So we have the movement of two electrons in our bond forming and bond breaking steps. Now, it's important that we remember a few rules for these polar reactions. The curved arrow for bond formation is drawn from the lone pair of one atom or the source of electron density, such as a pi bond, to the second atom. In other words, the arrow is drawn from the nucleophilic lone pair of the nucle or the nucleophilic bond to the electrophilic center. So in this case, if we're looking at this bond forming step, we're looking at this bond forming step, we draw an arrow from our nucleophilic lone pair to our electrophilic atom. And this arrow is representing the use of two electrons, the use of this oxygen's lone pair electrons to form a carbon oxygen bond. Does that idea make sense? We draw our reaction arrows from the nucleophilic site to the electrophilic site. Does that make sense to everyone? Perfect. So when we think about bond breaking steps, the curved arrow for bond breaking is drawn from the bond between the two atoms to the atom receiving the lone pair or the electron density. So we draw our arrow going from our bond to our typically most electronegative atom. Now, because this is a heterolytic bond breaking event, one of our atoms ends up with a negative charge and our other atom ends up with a positive charge. 
Does that idea make sense to everyone? Perfect, perfect. So, we often see these kinds of polar arrow pushing processes when we talk about heterolytic bond cleavage. And we also see these kinds of polar arrow pushing processes when we're talking about polar bond formation. So in heterolytic bond cleavage, the electrons shared between two atoms in a chemical bond are distributed to one atom only during the bond breaking. So another example of this, so let's suppose you have a carbon iodine bond. If we're breaking our carbon halogen bond under a heterolytic bond cleavage event under a polar mechanism, we'd again draw our arrow from the carbon halogen bond to the more electronegative atom receiving the electron density, in which case our halogen. That leaves us with a carbocation as well as a halide anion. So as we notice, all of the electron density in our carbon halogen bond ended up on our halogen, in this case, iodine. Does that make sense to everyone? It's really important that you're particular with how you draw the arrow and where you start and end your electron pushing arrow for mechanisms. If we're thinking about polar bond formation, our two bonding electrons are donated by one reactor. So in this case, for example, we have our cyanide anion attacking our carbocation, and that in turn forms a carbon-carbon bond. Now, this doesn't just have to be reserved to normal anionic nucleophiles. You can also, for example, have a double bond participate in these polar bond forming events. So for example, if we have a double bond and it is reacting with an equivalent of bromine, for example, actually let's make, let's make the mechanism a little bit easier to see. Let's look at an equivalent of HBr. The alkene can function as a nucleophile. There's an electrophilic hydrogen atom. So this alkene can simply just attack our hydrogen atom and we break our hydrogen bromine bond. You can draw this, this mechanism as concerted or you can also draw this as stepwise where the attack just occurs on H+. The key point of this example, the key reason why I'm bringing up this example is I don't want you to forget that alkenes and other electron-rich double bonds can function as perfectly capable nucleophiles. Does that idea make sense? And does everyone notice how for polar bond forming and bond breaking events, I use my double-headed arrow and each arrow signifies the, trans the movement of two electrons as part of bond forming and bond breaking? Perfect, perfect. Now, you may ask, are there other types of mechanisms besides just polar mechanisms? Well, yes. And to discuss this, we'll talk about a common arrow pushing convention. To signify the movement of a single electron, half arrow notation is used. So depending on the type of arrow that you draw, you're signifying the movement of a different number of electrons. This seems really nitpicky at first glance. It seems like a subtle detail at first glance, but this is really important to accurately conveying a reaction mechanism. 
So half arrow notation, it almost always comes up when we're talking about radical reactions. Just as a refresher for what a radical is, a radical is a species with an incomplete octet and an unpaired electron. Anytime you see an isolated dot, this is known as a radical. And this is signifying that the atom that has our radical associated with it has an incomplete octet and an unpaired electron. Radicals are not particularly stable for a variety of reasons, first of which they have an incomplete octet. Um, and as a result, radicals can often engage in further chemical reactions. Now what we're going to talk about next is how this half arrow notation can be described and utilized to describe radical mechanisms. So as the counterpart to our polar reactions and our heterolytic cleavage, radical reactions, a key bond breaking step is written as homolytic cleavage events. As the name implies, this is a symmetrical bond breaking where the electrons in the bond are evenly distributed to the two atoms as the bond is broken. So each of these arrows is saying one electron from our bond goes to each of our bromine atoms. You can also see an example of this if you have, for example, a carbon iodine bond and you use the correct reaction conditions, such as light, for example, you can induce a homolytic cleavage. Notice how I'm using the, the half arrow or the quote unquote fish hook arrow notation. And in turn, we end up with each of our atoms receiving one electron from this bond. So we have our carbon centered radical as well as an iodine centered radical. Does this idea of homolytic cleavage make sense? So each of our atoms gets one electron from our bond. It is fundamentally a radical mechanism. We are generating radicals as a result of homolytic cleavage. Perfect. Now, as a, so sort of as a corollary, to this idea of polar bond formation, we can also look at bond formation for radical reaction. So radicals are not are not are not basic because basicity is based on this idea of an electron rich atom with a relatively unstable or high energy or nucleophilic lone pair. While radicals they're more, they're more akin to an electron deficient species, while most basic atoms and most basic molecules have a relatively nucleophilic atom. Um, these this discussion of radicals and radical mechanisms, um, when, we, when you talk about the idea of free radicals in biology, um, a lot of mechanisms in biological processes um, primarily a lot of these oxidative processes occur via radical mechanisms. So to get us back on track, so when we talk about symmetrical bond formation or bond formation in radical mechanisms, the half arrow is drawn from the bond or radical contributing the electron to the location of the new bond formed. So in this case, our carbon is contributing a radical and our bromine is contributing a radical. Each of these atoms are contributing one electron to form a carbon bromine bond. Does that make sense to everyone? This idea in radical bond formation, each of our atoms contributes one electron. Does that idea make sense to everyone? So just as a refresher, bond formation 
each of our atoms contributes one electron in a radical mechanism. For bond breaking, our bond is broken and each of our atoms receives one electron from our broken bond. We draw two half arrows from the bond to each atom participating in that bond. Okay, so we've done a pretty good job at summarizing how to draw different mechanisms. But before we start and just start trying to draw different mechanisms, it's important that we understand and we sort of get a sense for what makes certain radicals stable, what makes certain carbocations stable, what makes certain anions stable, in order for us to draw reaction mechanisms that are reasonable and logical. So continuing on and taking this idea of radical mechanisms a little bit further, we're gonna talk next about radical reactions in detail and talk about metrics that we can use to assess the energetics of radical reactions and then assess the stability of different intermediates and the stability of Well, yeah, the stability of different intermediates and the plausibility of different bond forming and bond breaking steps. So unpacking radical reactions in detail, we can think about radical reactions as following multiple discrete steps. The first of which is known as the initiation step where two radical species are formed via homolytic bond cleavage. So your, uh, Ha your halogens such as bromine and iodine are great for these reactions. Another very common, another very common radical initiator are our peroxides. Peroxides when heated undergo heterolytic bond cleavage to generate two alkoxy radicals. So these are the common radical initiators that you'll see in different chemical reactions. Now, when we think about the initiation step, we actually have a metric to understand the energy required to break these bonds in a, homo, in a, in a homolytic fashion. So the main metric that we're going to be using to understand the energy required to break a bond in a homolytic fashion is the bond dissociation energy. This is the amount of energy required to break a given bond to produce two radical fragments when the molecule is in the gas phase at 25 degrees Celsius. And we can use these bond dissociation energies to approximate the energy required in solution. No, this is an approximation. It's not exact, but it gives us a sense of which bonds are easy to break and which bonds are quite difficult to break. So the following is a table of different bond dissociation energies. And one thing I'd like you to, to notice is just if we think about our carbon halogen bond, compared to, for example, a carbon-carbon bond, a carbon-halogen bond, such as a carbon-bromine bond, is relatively easy to break. It costs us a relatively small amount of energy to break this bond in a homolytic fashion. Does everyone see that from this table, how our bond dissociation energies are small for our carbon halogen bond? Perfect. Now, after we've actually generated our radical, our radical can undergo a propagation step where we have the reaction of our radical with another molecule to yield a new radical. Propagation can either occur in the first case via abstraction, where an atom is removed from a molecule 
to yield a new molecule and a new radical. So in this case, our bromine radical is just going to steal a hydrogen from this molecule of methane. That in turn gives us hydrobromic acid and a carbon-centered radical. I'd really want you to practice following along, drawing these arrow pushing mechanisms. So that way you get used to the mechanics and you're familiar with the process of drawing these mechanisms. We'll do plenty of practice, but I always want you whenever you see a mechanism drawn out in the notes to try to follow along and draw that mechanism out independently as well. Now, another way that propagation can occur is also via addition, where the radical adds to an alkene or other double or triple bond to in turn yield a new radical. So in this case, for example, we have our bromine radical. And if we have an alkene present, this bromine radical can add to the alkene and in turn generate a new bond and a new radical. This process is known as addition. Do these steps make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable with these steps as a draw? Perfect. Now, finally, the radical chain undergoes termination, where two radicals react to generate a stable product. So in this case, we have our carbon-centered radical and our bromine-centered radical, and they combine to reform a stable compound with a covalent carbon-bromine bond. This last step is known as termination, where we in turn terminate our radical chain via reaction of our two radicals. Does that idea make sense? Notice we're using fish hook or half head arrows because we're signifying the motion of a single electron from each of our atoms. Any questions so far on this idea? Any questions so far? Termination is where two radicals combine and react to generate a stable product. We have two radicals, each contributing one electron to form a new bond and end our radical chain because we've taken our radicals and we've generated a covalent, a covalent compound that does not have a radical. It's essentially the two radicals being used to form a bond. Does that make sense? Perfect. Uh, all of these mechanisms are covalent mechanisms, yes. Now, you may be asking, well, what determines, what determines selectivity for radical reactions? Are all of our bonds equally reactive? Obviously not. You can get selectivity based on the structure of the molecule that is engaging in the reaction. So, Let's talk now about the relative reactivity of alkyl carbon hydrogen bonds in radical reactions. So radicals are stabilized by adjacent bonded non-hydrogen atoms. Okay, so radical stability increases in order of methyl, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Um, 
So the methyl radical has the strongest bond and the largest bond dissociation energy because we make the least stable radical. The tertiary carbon hydrogen bond makes a tertiary radical, which is the most stable radical. Because again, it has the most adjacent bonded non-hydrogen atoms. So again, in order of stability, we have tertiary greater than secondary, greater than primary, which is greater than the methyl radical. Now, what's important to consider is that the most reactive carbon hydrogen bond to abstraction generates the most stable radical. So in general, if you have the option to generate a tertiary radical, there will be a preference to form a tertiary radical over a primary radical. Does this idea make sense to everyone? Does this idea make sense? Perfect. Now, just like our previous examples involving anions, radicals are stabilized via resonance. So radicals are stabilized by adjacent pi systems via resonance. That is why, even if we have a comparatively stable tertiary radical, an allylic radical formed via breaking an allylic carbon-hydrogen bond is even more stable. This allylic radical is even more stable than our tertiary radical because this allylic radical is stabilized via resonance. And the greater the number of conjugated pi systems adjacent to our radical, the more stable our radical in turn becomes. Radicals are still fundamentally unstable, but we can generate a more stable radical if that radical is conjugated to a greater number of pi systems, because you can delocalize and stabilize this radical via resonance. Does that idea make sense? Does that concept that radicals are stabilized via resonance make sense? Perfect. So resonance stabilization even trumps this substitution effect, where even a primary vinylic radical is more stable than a tertiary non-vinylic radical. So resonance effects have a greater effect than substitution. Now, to help us understand why that is, to help us understand why that is, we have to look at this idea of hyperconjugation, which is the overlap of a p orbital with an adjacent sigma bonding molecular orbital. So looking at our radical, looking at our radical, for our radical, we have a half fill p orbital that is electron deficient. Okay, and in hyperconjugation, we have our carbon hydrogen sigma bond. And in hyperconjugation, we observe a weak overlap. We observe a overlap between the empty p orbital and the electron rich carbon hydrogen sigma bond. This in turn stabilizes our half filled p orbital as we observe donation of electron density into 
the p orbital from the carbon hydrogen sigma bond. So similar to how, for example, a cation can be stabilized and delocalized via resonance as we're spreading our electron density over multiple atoms. In hyperconjugation, we have our adjacent sigma bond overlapping with our p orbital, donating electron density into our p orbital, and in turn, stabilizing our radical. Okay, so to help you visualize what's going on here, let's look at a model kit. Okay, perfect. So here's our p orbital, and let's just look at one of our adjacent carbon hydrogen bonds. Okay, so as we notice, the carbon hydrogen bond and our p orbital can be aligned in a way where our carbon hydrogen sigma bond can donate electron density and overlap with our p orbital. This donation in turn delocalizes some of our electron density from our sigma bond into our p orbital. So we're spreading our electron deficient character over multiple atoms. Not as pronounced as in resonance, but it's still quite pronounced. Now, what's really important to note is that the more bonded atoms that we have, the more adjacent sigma bonds we have available to engage in hyperconjugation. That can explain why, in general, radical stability increases with substitution, because we have more adjacent atoms and more adjacent sigma bonds that can overlap with and stabilize our p orbital via hyperconjugation. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? We have our adjacent sigma bonds. They can overlap with our p orbital donate electron density into our p orbital and stabilize our p orbital. You can, think, you can think of it as if we're partially delocalizing our electron deficient character over multiple atoms. And the more adjacent, the more adjacent bonded non-hydrogen atoms we have, the, the greater the stabilization we observe from these hyperconjugation effects. And this works even for carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-oxygen bonds. It also works for those bonds. That is why, in turn, this hyperconjugation effect is most pronounced when we're dealing with tertiary radicals compared to secondary and primary, because we have more adjacent carbon-hydrogen bonds to engage in, in hyperconjugation. Does this idea make sense to everyone? Does this idea make sense? Perfect. So, just to reiterate one more time, Hyperconjugation of adjacent sigma bonding molecular orbitals stabilizes the radical in the p orbital. Radicals fundamentally are electron deficient species, so donation of electron density into the p orbital stabilizes our radical. Thus, radicals are stabilized by increasing substitution. This really explains why our tertiary radicals are way more stable than secondary radicals, which are in turn more stable than primary radicals. Any questions on this idea? Hyperconjugation is something that we will see again, actually, in the next few minutes, mind you. Um, so does anyone have any questions on hyperconjugation? <laughs> 
Okay. So, just to reiterate on our terminology, an allylic substituent is defined as a substituent located in a carbon adjacent to a double bond. So this hydrogen would be considered allylic. As we discussed previously, allyl radicals are stabilized via resonance. And as a result, one inter interesting consequence of this is that allylic carbon hydrogen and carbon halogen bonds are easier to break. They have lower bond dissociation energies than expected. And that is because at the end of our bond breaking step, we generate a relatively stable radical. Okay. So to talk a little bit about substituent effects, let's talk about how adjacent substituents can impact the stability of a radical. So first radicals adopt what is known as a shallow pyramid geometry, allowing the half-filled p orbitals to interact with adjacent p orbitals and pi bonds. Radicals can be delocalized via resonance through the overlap of the radical containing p orbitals and the adjacent pi system. This is why allylic radicals are substantially more stable compared to vinylic radicals. because in the case of the allylic radicals, it can be delocalized via resonance. Now, continuing on with this idea of resonance stabilization of radicals, as radicals are electron deficient species, atoms with lone pairs adjacent to a radical can stabilize radicals by donation of electron density into the radical. And it's important to note that our resonance donors are more efficient donors if they are less electronegative and can accommodate a positive charge more readily. So looking at the following examples, if we think about a methyl radical, it's not very stable at all. There's no adjacent donor group. There's no adjacent lone pair donors. Comparatively, if we have a alkyl fluoride derived radical, the fluorine can donate a little bit of its electron density to generate the following resonance structure. However, I'd like to ask you the following question. Does this look very stable? Does this look very stable? Does this look like a major contributor? Is fluorine really thought of as an electron donor or is fluorine more of an electron withdrawing group? So I see a lot of students typing in the chat, no, it's withdrawing. Yep, so fluorine is electron withdrawing by induction. And this, this inductive effect beats out our resonance effect. When we start to get to radicals adjacent to, for example, a hydroxy group, otherwise known as an alcohol, you can see substantial stabilization of our radical via resonance. However, this carbon ends, sorry, this oxygen ends up electron deficient. And so if we compare this to our radical adjacent to an amine, for example, this radical adjacent to an amine is more stable because our amine can more readily accommodate and can more readily accommodate a positive charge and is more readily able to accommodate electron deficiency. 
So this nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. So as a result, it's a more effective resonance donor than an inductive withdrawer. And as a result, it can more effectively stabilize our radical. Does that idea make sense? Does that concept make sense to everyone? Perfect. So when we think about atom effects now, we have to consider how the actual atom that the radical is located influences the radical stability. Now fundamentally, and I can't stress this enough, radicals are electron deficient species and they're destabilized when they're placed on an electronegative atom. That's why the carbon centered radical are, are the most stable while a fluorine centered radical will be the least stable. Now in terms of atom effects, Radicals are more stable on larger atoms as you can delocalize this electron deficient character over a larger region of space. So radical stability increases going down the periodic table since we have a larger atom at play. That is why an iodine radical or a bromine radical is relatively stable. Now, stability is not always a good thing because it also constrains the reactivity of our radical and limits the ability of our radical to engage in our desired reaction. But nonetheless, if you look at a radical bond breaking step where you're generating an iodine radical, the iodine radical would be relatively stable. Does this idea of atom effects on radical stability make sense? Does that make sense to everyone so far? Perfect. So let's talk next about orbital effects for ra radicals. Now, radicals are electron deficient species and are destabilized the closer they are to the nucleus. If we have more S character, we have a shorter orbital that is closer to the nucleus, and that in turn destabilizes our electron deficient radical. So my question to you is, what's the hybridization for this, for this carbon right here? What's the hybridization for this carbon right here in our alkyne? What's the hybridization? sp, right? And if we think about an sp orbital, if we think about an sp orbital, we are essentially holding our radical held very close to the nucleus. And the nucleus is positively charged. So this electron deficient radical really doesn't want to be in an orbital that is held close to the nucleus. So sp radicals are particularly unstable. sp2 are a little bit more stable with our sp3 radicals being the most stable. Does this orbital effect argument seem familiar? We've used the same argument when we talked about the stability of anions, right? Does this idea make sense to everyone? Does this idea of orbital effects make sense? Radicals are electron deficient. SP orbitals are closer to the nucleus and in turn radicals and SP orbitals are less stable because they are destabilized by the nuclear charge. Okay, let's talk about inductive effects. So electron withdrawing groups destabilize free radicals. That makes sense. 
radicals are electron deficient. So the more electron withdrawing groups we have, the less stable our radical would be. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on this idea? Okay, so let's keep going. And as I wrap up for today's session, let's indicate the lowest energy radical for each pair of radicals. So I'll start us off and I'm gonna ask for your help on this. So if we compare a benzylic to an allylic radical, which radical would be more stable? Which radical is most stabilized, most delocalized via resonance? The allylic or the benzylic? What does everyone think? Column A or column B? Which radical would be more stable? Allylic or benzylic? And to help everyone potentially see a trend, here's one arrow pushing structure. Well, for our benzylic species, we can potentially delocalize this radical throughout our entire ring. So which radical would be most stable? A, yep, exactly right. Our benzylic radical would be the most stable as we're able to delocalize our radical over a total of seven atoms compared to three for our allylic species. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? Perfect. Okay, what about a chlorine versus a bromine radical? Which radical would be lowest in energy? So thinking about atom effects, larger atom, so the bromine radical would be lower in energy. Exactly right. What about this next case? So we're comparing an sp2, a vinylic radical, to an sp3 radical. Which radical is lower in energy, sp2 or sp3? sp3, exactly right. Perfect. Do these examples make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense to everyone? So why does this matter? Well, when you're thinking about reaction selectivity, you really wanna focus on, well, my reaction generally will prefer to go through lower energy intermediates in many cases. So by, by being able to identify the most reactive bonds that can break under radical me mechanisms, the most stable or preferentially preferred radicals that will form, the more you can effectively predict the products of reactions and you can rationalize the products observed from different chemical reactions. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? So this will be a, a great point for us to halt today's recording.